look at all everything's going to hell and even people that are radically against christianity start to you know go well wait, wait a second you're telling me that you're telling a three-year-old they can change their gender when they don't even know their favorite color that they're sponges at that ages that's why god continues to tell us guard your children protect your children parents Train them up in the way they will go and they'll not depart from it. It's getting so bad because of the notion that Christianity is a joke. By saying that, they're saying there's no absolute truth, there's no absolute way, there's no absolute life, there's no absolute. It gets us to a place where there is such confusion and a lack of complete common sense. Welcome to Christian Podcast in America. Today we're going to save America by saving California. The state, the golden state, is it even worth saving? Let's find out. All right, my friends, you guys know me. I'm Beto Gudiño. And just want to say this show is sponsored by Christian Podcast Media Company. Check us out at christianpodcast.com. We have more amazing stuff coming up for you. And with no further ado, I want to introduce you to my friend today, Sam Galucci. Or Galuxi, let's see, let's see even how, if I say Bingo. it right. How are Galucci. you? Galucci, it's Italian. Italian, Galucci. Galucci. Presto, per favore. <laughs> okay, perfect. Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, let's kick us off with a little bit of who you are, what you do, and why are you trying to save California? <laughs> yeah, I'm a 60, uh, 61 year resident of California. Uh, came here when I was two years old, so that dates me. My parents came from New York, and uh, they were uh, immigrants to this land, like so many in the previous generation. And uh, they came to California, the Golden State, and at that time it was golden for a dream, right? Like uh, the the other, you know, the tens of millions of families that came to California. And um, uh, I was raised here. I was raised in. Uh, Uh, in LA. I went to school in San Diego and then launched a very successful tech career, the beginning of the tech industry in San Francisco, and uh, got saved in 1980. So uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, San Diego State, got wrecked by God. I was a rock and roll, uh, I was a rock and roll, uh, uh, you know, party animal at San Diego State, and God got a hold of me and changed my life. And um, I was at the beginning of the tech era, So uh, one of the tech pioneers actually uh, uh, birthed several, I was an entrepreneur in the beginning of everything before internet was a thing, before Microsoft, before Apple. And so I was one of those guys at a very young age that literally birthed an industry. And uh, by the time I was uh, 35, I was traveling the world um, uh, as a luminary in the field of technology and uh, was a part. Uh, and by the time I was 40, I was running a major billion dollar company in the, in, in, uh, in the Bay Area. And, uh, and then at 40 years old, I was a prodigal. I had run away from God and uh, my What? career was my God and uh, full of sin and all that stuff as I was climbing the ladder. And I had this divine encounter with God as uh, my family was slipping away and I didn't want to be another statistic. And God got a hold of me in a radical way, kind of like a Paul on the road to Damascus experience. So I came home and um, left the career to rescue my marriage. We did that successfully. It was really an amazing story. That was back in the year 2000. And, uh, and then we just started to help other couples. We were, we were that, you know, that radical, you know, crazy, uh, full of sin, uh, that grace abounds over that, that rescued us. And so, uh, so then, um, came home and uh, after three hard years, our marriage started to flourish, was on 700 Club in several places about rescuing marriages. Then I started working on rescuing guys that were in sexual sin. Next thing you know, I'm back in seminary. 
uh, and uh, uh, and getting the education. And then I uh, launched and pastored a church in Ventura. And so from the boardroom, I went to uh, to the homeless fields, uh, to the homeless uh, parks, and became a pastor to the homeless. And uh, with my entrepreneurial skills, basically um, uh, birthed several uh, nonprofits that uh, worked in the margins. Basically, uh, you know, uh, the foolish things of man to confound the wise. And so uh, built uh, an incredible uh, uh, ministry to rescue homeless. I was the pastor to the homeless and thousands of homeless got saved uh, and then um, got shut down by the city of Ventura and uh, government agency in 2012 because of homeless, too many homeless were coming to our church and, uh, you know, people didn't like that. And we tried to reconcile that. They wouldn't. They shut us down. So we took on a federal court, won a major landslide victory, got kicked out of Ventura, came to Oxnard, and then started working with the undocumented migrant farm workers. And uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, when nobody else wanted them, we we started to minister to them, the Oaxacans, uh, their native language, Mosteco. And now, you know, uh, well over a thousand call me their pastor. I've planted micro churches in the fields and have just been about my father's business, going to Samaria, going to the woman in the well, and just doing crazy radical things for Jesus. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, that's a little bit about me. Wow. And you didn't even mention you ran for a governor, right? Of I California. I, <laughs> I did. I ran for governor. I, that was the craziest thing. And, uh, you know, uh, when, when Jesus rescues you radically, I mean, when you, you know, when you are so far from God and, and the religious establishment says you're not, you know, don't go near me, right? You're just not worthy. And, and you realize, you believe that. You're like, I'm not worthy of anything. And God rescues you so mightily, you can't help because of your love for the real Jesus, the radical, insane, incredible Jesus, um, uh, that you'll do anything for him. And that's me. And uh, this state was abs is absolutely worth rescuing for a lot of reasons. So I put my hat in the ring and that was um, the most radical thing I did. And, uh, and now we're doing other things because of that. All right. Oh, wrong emoji. Wrong emoji again. Oh, there we go. This is my reaction then. This is what I want to kick us off with. It's the emoji tombola. All right? So we're going to ask, gods of Emojitron, what is the emoji reaction to kick off today's episode? And let's start with the skeptical emoji. Skeptical emoji. All right? So let's go back to Sam. Sam, uh, the gods of Emojitron have picked skeptical for us, right? What, okay. I'm, what I'm hearing right now is people are leaving California. People right. are moving to other places. And right. I'm all about saving America. I used to be like, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to save the right. planet. And then I thought, I'm in America for a reason. I'm an immigrant. And when I came to this country, I thought... I want to be a missionary to this land. So that sparked something new in me in the latest episodes, I would say, where I thought, I'm, I'm doing this so broad. Let's narrow it down to America. And specifically in this episode, let's narrow it down to California because this is the place where I'm in. And all of the stuff you mentioned, I relate to so much of it. I mean, from immigration, from undocumented, from homeless in the streets from even like the pastoral i see a church everywhere so i'm like what's going on what's going on in california um why are there so many homeless i don't know if people you know when people think of california they think of maybe hollywood the hollywood sign and mm -hmm. if you have been to hollywood lately it looks awful you know i tell my friends who come right. from from other countries whatever they come either mexico or europe And they're like, I want to see the Hollywood sign. I'm like, there's nothing to see, man. <laughs> you don't want to go. It's ugly. But anyways, I think it's a cultural thing, right? But from your right. vantage point, um, is it, I mean, Juan, you already said it's, it's kind of like it's worth trying to save California. But isn't it, I mean, what is the problem that you see? Besides everything you mentioned, what, what would you 
assess as like this is the problematic that we have in this state it is the timeless problem it is not just now it is all through the history of mankind it is in one word hope mm. you know i that's uh you know uh it, it look uh there there either there it comes down to this issue of in every generation um the generations before us define this generation and uh and you you know we we either exist for a purpose we either god either created us we either believe there's absolute truth or we don't and all through history time and time again history repeats itself you know we're on a hamster hamster wheel and uh and we we think we're not but we are because we keep repeating the cycles and uh and we are in another cycle and it's either hope or hopelessness truth or uh or or absolute truth or any anything goes and uh and you know uh we're in another one of those cycles and it it's been said the only way evil prevails is if good people do nothing and every generation you are here beto because of your forefathers standing and fighting to give you a chance to be in this country wherever they came from whatever they did their sacrifice got you here and the only question for you and i is what sacrifice will we endeavor for our kids and our grandkids and um and you know uh i firmly believe there is a god i firmly believe there is absolute truth that he created us i think you need a baptism of common sense if you think this mm -hmm. just happened by accident i think that's the most ridiculous thing to think of if you're an intelligent human being that there isn't an intelligent designer the data uh, of every size and shape makes it clear and uh and so there will be a there will be a day when you and i either you know if if we are see or if we've received jesus through the grace of god because he's not willing that any should perish and either we receive it and then we're in heaven and then we're part of the cloud of witnesses and the bible tells us we'll be looking down on this on on future generations and we'll have an awareness and uh and the bible tells us that clearly and so uh as you get older you start to realize that um uh you know uh futile fu it's all futile this life is a breath and it's over uh, uh ecclesiastic solomon got it right right and uh, on that one and and what you do with your life matters and uh or it won't it's just that simple and so uh you and i will either live and die truly and we'll either go to heaven or we won't god's design is that no, no one perishes uh, and either we'll be remembered or we'll or we won't and uh either we'll have made a difference or we won't and um so this is about hope and right now we live in hopeless times and people are like ah what's the use it's all going to hell anyway so Let's just go home and have a drink or forget about it. It's not worth saving. It's not nothing good can happen anymore. And you know, and uh if you want to believe that, uh be well, be fed and get out of the way because uh <laughs> because there are always those that will stand in times when it is absolutely impossible. And uh and those are the ones that make history. Those are the ones that their destiny will align with the greatness of God. Those are the ones God will use and they'll fulfill all the purposes of God in their generation. And the naysayers simply just get out of the way, you know, and don't be an obstacle to those that God will use. Why? Because history tells us time and time and time and time again that uh you come into a generation and it's the same thing. I'm skeptical. Nothing good can happen. Okay, get out of the way and let me lead and those like us and that's fine you can be skeptical and you can sit on the sidelines and you know what um you're going to miss the greatness of God in your life you're going to settle for uh fast food for the rest of your life and i think uh god will still love you but man um uh, it is about standing it is about the journey of life than this incredible opportunity um to understand this incredible love and to journey in it in this radical way that changes history. 
And uh, and that's what I want to do. Okay, so I understand radicalness for Jesus. I think, you know, as a Christian, I, I understand the verbiage. And this is where I would go. Uh, I was just listening to the number one podcast on the planet. Well, I, I should say the second best podcast on the planet with Joe Rogan, right? Because this is the number yeah, one good. podcast. Come this on. One right here. Uh, Christian podcast. But anyways, I was listening to this guy. And he was interviewing a Christian guy who works at a, a, a company called the Babylon Bee, where they do satire yeah, and they right. make jokes about everything. Uh, but what what caught my attention is that in the conversation, he was saying, and this is a guy whose podcast is listened like every episode by like 10 million people, right? right? And the phrase he uses is somewhere along the lines of like everybody knows that Christianity, out of all the religions. It's it's silly. It's almost like laughable, right? So this is a guy who's broadcasting this right. to millions of people and saying, right. why should we even look at Christianity? It's laughable. So when I take that perspective and think, why are we even... I mean, that's the view people have of Christians. Why even run for politics, right, as, as a leader and try to say, I want to change things, if it almost seems like the odds are against us, right? The majority thinks otherwise. So how do you bring, I love the phrase that you said, common sense. And so when we're talking about truth and common sense, how do we bring truth and common sense in a, in a world that says, I laugh at that? Yeah, that is, that is the beauty of the word of God. All through history, the odds were radically against God. <clears throat> and and history continues to repeat itself on that. And that's the beauty. I want to tell you, I wouldn't be anywhere else in time because anyone that says Christianity is a joke is, is a, I would say, compared to what? Mm. Your belief? Are you God? Oh, you're going to get to decide everything by your beliefs. Well, uh, that hasn't worked out very well. Look at all, everything's going to hell. And Even people that are radically against Christianity start to start to you know go well wait, wait a second um, you're telling me that you're telling a three year old they can change their gender when they don't even know their favorite color I mean you know it's like uh, <laughs> and what why did that happen because of the and I and I and I'm just I'm just radical the stupidity of the idea that there's not an absolute truth and that somehow you can get away with putting making man their own God. And look how that's worked out, right? That's worked out just great. We, we have the highest crime rates, the highest death rates, the highest suicide rates. We're now telling little girls they can, you know, they can change their gender. We're chemically castrate, castrating kids. Hello. Um, you know, before the age of consent and you know, before they, they figured out life. I mean, um, that we're sexualizing them. And I, I mean, uh, it's the insanity that's going on. Everything is relative. And when someone tells me Christianity is a joke compared to what? Because <laughs> I would tell you that it's the only thing that makes any sense, any logical sense, common sense, um, any sorts of sense. And, uh, And so that's why I love being in this time in history, because um, I love being the underdog, because we're never the underdog. Uh, I, I just, you know, Elijah is, you know, he's got, he's by himself, and then the prophets of Baal are sitting there, and it's one against 450. And that story, like so many stories, uh, are so uh, amazing to me, because here he's all by himself, and you've got these 450 people saying, God's a joke. Christianity is, uh, you know, the Bible is a joke. The, ten, you know, the whole thing is a joke. There is no God. I'm my own God. I'll do whatever I want. And they had child sacrifice and they were, you know, and they're, and they're radical. And so he's saying, hey, why don't you call on your gods? And they're ratting and raving because they think God's a joke. And he goes, hey, and, 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 and Elijah says, hey, maybe they're asleep. Why don't you yell louder? So they're yelling and hollering and hooting and cutting themselves because God's a joke. And uh, and then nothing happens. And then he gets these big barrels of water and he pours them on the altar. Pour another one, pour another one, pour another one. And then God just consumes it and they all fall down. And 
we are uh, once again in this place that I wouldn't want to be any other place. And it's getting so bad because of the notion that Christianity is a joke. By saying that, they're saying there's no absolute truth. There's no absolute way. There's no absolute life. There's no absolute. And, uh, and, and, uh, and what I would say to that is, look what it's gotten us. Is this what you want? Because this is what it gets us. It gets us to a place where there is such confusion and a lack of complete common sense, where the children are being trafficked before our eyes, where the English language is, is, being, is, is being destroyed by this minute group of people that need desperately need help, where, where the kids are getting sexualized at the youngest ages, uh, and uh, where, where the ideology that's being taught to them is that you are a victim. It's like, that's what you want, right? Because you said Christianity is a joke. Therefore, you, you know by saying that, you're saying, ah, that's what I want. I want my kids to think they're victims the rest of their life. I want my kids to think that they can change their, their gender. I want those chemicals put in. Because the lie is that there's a better alternative and look out! Look, look what it's gotten us. It's gotten us nothing. And so this is our turn at bat in the history books of time. This is our opportunity to walk the walk and talk the talk if we really believe in faith. And God has made it so clear. It's like, hello, McFly Christians. Um, you know, if you were doubting absolute truth, I'm trying to make it pretty obvious what the alternative is um, to this nation, to your freedoms, to your children, to your values, to your family, to your infrastructure, to your money, to every dimension of your life. I'm trying to make it really obvious that there really is a difference here and your turn at bat. So you can either swing the bat or you can go home. And I'll use someone else, but uh, this story is so predictable. And we, and listen, we either believe the word or we don't, because this is the story time and time and time again that the Bible lays out. And either we step into it or we say, I would rather have all this other stuff. And, and those are the only two choices. I, I get to drink of one or two cups the cup of truth or the cup of nonsense. Those are the only two choices. <laughs> and uh, and so the lie of the enemy, the voice of lies, the father of lies, is controlling the airways with such perverted lies. Even people far from God are like, wait, wait, what? What just happened? No, I, I'm not I'm not interested in that. So that's what I'd say to that. Wow. Oof. Well, man, you said a lot. So uh let's go here. Because I feel like it, it, There's truth. There's you're saying there's absolute truth, and there's people who are claiming there's not such thing as absolute truth. And the only part of me that maybe tries to feel a little bit of empathy for for that section of people who are maybe even feeling like victims, right? Or yes. that's that's the description you use. But uh, here it goes. It's somewhere along the lines of there is no absolute truth because. You don't know my experience, right? right. And the interesting part is that I do feel like you cannot invalidate someone's experience. Like no, someone's you can't. experience, it's it's their experience and it's unique. And for example, like I'm an immigrant, right? And even though uh, there, there's a lot of voices when it comes to immigration and undocumented and all of that, and especially here in California, right? But uh, but the fact that okay, so. You you cannot invalidate my experience. Like it's it's no, only me who can't. has walked through that. So how do you move the needle from this is my experience and to I mean common sense is kind of like embedded in the world. Like it's common. So why is it not being common? Why is it like uh, everybody's it's it's undergoing their own experience? How can we say okay we're not invalidating your experience? But here is how we find commonality. Why is it just like, yes. how do and we find that? Yes, and there is, Beto, that is such a good question. 
And I so appreciate you asking it. This is what's wrong with the church. Mm. It's not simply Jesus anymore. It's got religious. Once again, every generation we slip into man starts to take the reins and all of a sudden we're adding all these laws to the Sabbath, right? And But if you get back to simply Jesus, followers of Jesus, there is a de- there's a place in the DNA of every person that God created for himself. And every one of those persons is absolutely right. None of us can know their experience, but Jesus does. That's why he came and became a man. And once again, it's the same argument I had before Jesus touched my life. You don't know my story. You don't know, understand. So what was and that? What that, was your story before you met Jesus uh, that people can I, I relate a, today? Yeah, no, I, I was uh, I, I, I was raised in an immigrant family, Italian immigrant family. I, uh, we were marginal Catholics, nothing against the Catholic Church. I just had no relevance to it. And I, I grew up with Led Zeppelin and uh, rock and roll. And I loved rock and roll you know, all of the bands of that time. And uh, I was a, I was a football player. I was a party animal, uh, you know, weed and, uh, and, you know, drugs and alcohol were, I mean, prevalent in the seventies and we were seventies, you know, and it was life, sex, rock and roll party. And, um, and like so many of us just kind of lost and, uh, and, You know, and and I had this idea that Jesus and, you know, Christianity was for, you know, Christianity was for weaklings, you know, just for people that are, you know, crying on their, you know, and they, they, they need, a, I don't need that. I'm my own person. I'm, you know, I can do, make my own decisions. And, uh, and then one day, you know, here I am, um, this strong person, and I hear the gospel message. And from a guy, Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict back in those in 1980, San Diego State University. And um, and I go to a crusade that night. I was invited and I, I had a curiosity. And I go to the crusade and it, it, there's all this evidence that God really existed. God created the heavens and the earth. And, and the evidence was so overwhelming. It's like, okay, maybe there is a God and maybe there is an absolute truth. I don't see it for myself. So they had an altar call and all these Kids came down. I was 19 at the time, and uh, I didn't. So I go back to my uh, apartment, and there's my roommate smoking, smoking, smoking weed. And he came in. He was all upset because we were going to smoke weed together. And and uh, he goes, "Where were you? And you know, where the blippity blip were you?" And and I said, ah, "I went to this meeting. What was the meeting about? Well, they were talking <laughs> about Jesus." And I'm like, "And and 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 that's what was crazy. They didn't talk about." Christianity. They didn't talk about religion. They just talked about Jesus and this radical man called Jesus. And he went to the woman of the at the well and nobody got her. He went to the Samaritan. He went to the Gentile. He went to the tax collectors. He went, he went to where all the partying was. He went to the parties and that's, that's where he hung out. And so I'm telling my roommate who's so far from God and I'm far from God I'm telling him these stories that I heard that, and he goes, wow, so what is this Jesus like? So I'm telling him what they told me Jesus was like. And then he goes, well, um, do you think he knows me? I go, well, they said he knows you better than you know yourself. And so I am telling him all this stuff and he gets on his knees. He says, what must I do to get saved? I said, well, they said to say this prayer, he gets saved And I'm still not saved. And I was so moved by it. It's like, whoa, God knew me so well. And he knew me so well. He knew in my own strength that I could never do anything. I didn't need God in any way. And yet through me and through what he shared with me, he gave me a picture of himself in a way that only I could receive. And I realized that somebody did get me. God, uh, Jesus really understands me. And it was the first time I really felt that. And so I got on my knees and I, and I received Jesus, my Lord and Savior. There was no pop in circumstance. There was no band. There was no altar call up to the front. And I want you to say these words. You know, none of that. It was, it was me by myself receiving Jesus. And, and I want to say to everyone that, 
um, that's the difference between religion and relationship. And it's universal. And in this generation, it's no difference. I saw thousands of homeless receive Jesus on Sunday. Um, if you look at our, my, our sermons, embracejesus.org, if you go to Embrace Simply Jesus on our YouTube channel on Sunday, I, uh, I gave a message out of Acts chapter four, the most important chapter of, uh, of the New Testament church is Acts chapter four, what happened in Acts chapter four, I believe. And uh, we had this homeless ministry and we were caring for the people nobody wanted. And they're the homeless. And if anyone could say with certainty that no one gets me, um, the homeless, they are treated worse than animals. I have, a, my, my, I have several books out. One of them is More Than Animals. You can get it on Amazon. And it chronicles the story of a, a generation of people that truly can say, if you have a home, if you have a life and you say, nobody gets me, um, a homeless person feels that on steroids because they're, they're passed by like they're, they're, they're treated less than animals. At least you have a home and they're people that, you know, you, you have someone in your life, you have some dignity of, a, of housing. When, when you lose all that, you got nothing. You, you are, you, you have nothing. And, 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 um, and so we were simply understanding this incredible grace that Jesus can get you. No one else can. That is the mystery. And that is the miracle that the world has proven to you does not have. So any belief, we all believe something. That's a fact. You have faith in something. The question is, where are you going to place it? And the greatest gift God gave us at birth was free will to choose anything we want. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, so, that's, that's yeah. the story. So if Jesus is, is the source of hope and transformation and the one that the, the radical changer in life, yes. why run for like, why become involved in politics? Like do politics matter? And at this point, I mean, I, I'm going to kind of like make the assumption it didn't work or how was it for you? Was it a failed attempt? What did you learn from, from running running for governor? Like, was it worth it? Uh, do you think there's a shot for even Christians to do that? Should they do that? Do yeah, we have a chance? I think, I, I, well, first of all, uh, it was absolutely worth it. And it was, it was what God had asked me to do. And, you know, uh, there were th years of prayer into that, but also I had a capacity, a business capacity to run the sixth largest economy. And I also had, um, you know, I had connected with the largest single voting block in the history of California, the Hispanic vote, 40% of the population is Hispanic, Latino, not including the undocumented, it's probably over 50% now. And I care for undocumented. They, they, I'm their pastor. I love them, right? So uh, here I am, this radical conservative Jesus followers that's caring for a group of people that I just fall in love with, the Hispanic people well before I ever had any notion of this. So I'd earn the right to speak to him. And I'd say, you know, just because someone speaks Spanish, you don't earn the right, right? You have to, <laughs> you have to be about the people's business. And, uh, and then homelessness. I've, I've solved the biggest single issue that we have in our state, the, the gross incompetence by our leaders. And anyway, so, uh, and so God had called me into that. And was it worth it? Absolutely. And here's why. Um, the church was birthed in politics. The church was birthed in politics and Jesus was killed because of the threat he was to the political system. That's it. And it was the, the, if you have to remember the Sadducees, the temple police were police. They were the police force. They were the local magistrates. They were the local government officials. Uh, and the, the, the half truth that it was about the religious power no, it was about their political power. All through the Old Testament, these guys knew the Old Testament better than any pastor today would, frankly. They had it memorized. And, uh, and, and, and their faith continued to grow through persecution all the time. It was their political power. They were threatened by Jesus and uh, by his message, his message of love, his message of hope, his message of freedom, of freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of a conscience that is free from indoctrination. 
Every single nation on the face of the earth controls their people. Tell me how that worked out. It hasn't. Mm -hmm. History continues to tell us that. The lie is that somehow, you know, following the father of lies, because that's, there's only two choices, the father of truth or the father of lies. The lie is that there's a third choice. That's the biggest lie of all. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, um, and so Jesus was killed on the cross because he threatened political power. And we have gotten to a place where this nation was birthed on Christianity. That's an absolute fact. And in fact, our history uh, is being absolutely destroyed. But there's only two nations that were in covenant, government, relationship with God, Israel. Uh, when they came into the promised land, God gave them a form of government that never existed, where the people were the sovereign and God was their king. And that, that was reborn with America. It was born as a Christian nation. And this, the, again, this, the, every other nation looks at us and it's like, they're like, what's, what's with America? If, if you go to India, it's a Hindu nation. No one complains about that. When you go to the Middle East, you know, right? It's a Muslim nation. Chris, and America was a Christian nation. And, uh, and, you know, and it was birthed on that. It was born on that. And, uh, and it's like for Christians to say, I know I'd rather be fully in slavery again. This freedom we have, it's not that big a deal. I'd rather go back to be governed by a dictator. I mean, you know, and, and, and yet that's not our reality. This nation was birthed on that. And this is all about how God is going to reach this nation again, the great awakening to the reality of true hope again. And so I was called into this fight simply doing what Jesus did and, uh, and bringing, bringing awareness back to the reality that the church was birthed on politics. Acts chapter four was, was, that was the whole thing, right? They were baptized in the Holy spirit. Um, they, uh, they, they started to meet, they all met together and then they met house to house. Then Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. They heal this dude. And now they're brought before the local government officials, government officials. And, and they say, under no circumstances are you ever to preach in that name. Why? Because their political power was threatened. And they stood, they stood and said, I'm sorry, but whether you think it's right or not, we will not stop saying his name. What happened? The church got together and prayed for the supernatural boldness and the same earthquake that occurred on the cross when he said it is finished happened. They prayed for this boldness in Acts 4, 29 to 31, and the earth shook. It's the same word. It's this powerful shaking, and the church exploded, and it was the, it was the first great revival and awakening of truth in, 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 in a long time, and we're at that point again. And so I simply did what I was called to do. I learned a tremendous amount of how manipulated the, the agenda to completely rule Every aspect of life, California is the melting pot of, uh, of they, it, it is the incubator for taking over America. I am fully convinced I have learned so much um, uh, through socialism. And, you know, and of course, that's a big debate about socialism. But history, again, is just look it up. You know, if you have a common sense, you have a brain, look up socialism all through time and tell me if you like that actually and uh and, and i'm i'm pretty sarcastic too because the urgency of the hour is such that we all need a baptism of common sense and just start to think beyond just the rhetoric everyone's telling you um and so uh, and so i simply did what jesus did confronted truth with power i learned an awful lot and 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 the result of it is things that we're doing now to rescue our children and to be a voice here in California because California has birthed, and this is what we need to understand in America, California is number one in innovation, in, uh, in, in the birth of technology, in the birth of imagination, 
in the birth of more major ministries that have been uh, impacted the world for Christ. It is the birth, it is the, it is the, the place God has used more than any other place. And this notion where California goes, the, the nation goes, is absolutely true. So the battle is here. And as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to be on the front lines. And those that don't, bye, go hide somewhere. Um, but this is that, that the prophets said all through history. Um, and this is about uh, this is about my grandkids, your kids and grandkids, and fighting the good fight of faith that every generation before us has. And, uh, and so that's why I ran and, and it's allowing me the opportunity to speak to amazing, a man like you, Beto, and be on this show. And that's why I ran. Wow. Okay. I love that. And, you know, thank you for your, your pursuing, uh, yeah, just pursuing that, that passion, that vision, even that calling to be there. And this is where I'll go. I mean, it, you said the church was born in politics Uh, America was it was a Christian nation, so all of that. It's I mean it's striking, almost like some sort of like dissonance in my brain because, I mean as much as that sounds great, you even said there's a minority of people who are pushing these agendas, right? So why are let's say if Christians are to govern, why are we not there, and why are we not maybe the majority when it comes to government? Why is this minority go governing? The state. The majority, right? Yes. Because we have lost our way. Uh, we have forgotten who we are, and we have forgotten our role. And it happened, and every single, uh, all through history, again, you look at every nation on the face of the earth, uh, uh, they usually collapse in seven, 17 to 25 years. Um, Roman Empire was probably the biggest, na the biggest one, right? And it lasted quite a long time. This Grand American experiment is uh, has done more to bless the world than any nation on the history of the planet throughout time. And the reason why the minority is controlling the majority is that the majority are asleep at the wheel. Pastors have forgotten their role in the government mandate, uh, and we have uh, we we have. Uh, we have been put asleep by this notion that uh, you know uh, we uh, we are we are not we are not to take our stand in history. It is because of complacency. It's it's because of confusion, and it's because of a lack of stepping into um, our role in history. And uh, and. Um, And that's why that's that's absolutely why why we've gotten to the place that we have, uh, you know. And we took our eye off our uh, uh, the mandate of Christ, you know. He the government it says shall be on his shoulder, and uh, and when when this nation was born, it was founded on Christianity. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States was founded on sermons uh, of pastors. It was it was it was built on this, and for the first uh, 150 years, everything was vetted through the pastors. It was a Christian nation built on freedom and Christianity, and uh, and then something happened where uh, a, a, a generation of pastors came up, and they they bought the Kool Aid by a few people that pastors have no business in politics. And it, the Johnson Amendment was a big, you know, the separation of church and state got confused. It was a, it was to keep the state out of the church, not the church out of the state. And uh, and so uh, and it's it, it was it was a generation. And frankly, our generation is is a lot to blame. And the generation before us that bought the Kool Aid and stopped paying attention to to public education. Uh, to the to the mountains of influence and making sure that uh, we uh, we taught the full gospel and we stepped into that. Okay, and that's why. Yeah. So two things. So uh, I feel like almost like what you're saying is, if a Christian is not in power, we are failing, right? But also, I'm thinking, how do you even know if the if the guy that makes uh, if the guy that makes 
gets to power, what if he doesn't really represent Jesus, right? He might represent Christianity, but what if he doesn't represent Jesus? And what if that's precisely the view that people are having of Christianity that say, I don't want a Christian in power? Is that is that part of it? And you even talked about socialism. So I feel like overall, if we're not in power, are we failing? Are we losing? Yeah, we're not in power and Christians aren't governing this country. And uh and and you know, we've we've gotten to the place where Christians aren't voting. 40% in the state of California, only 40% of Christians are registered to vote. Only about uh two thirds of them vote biblically. And uh and because it's not taught from the pulpit, it's not a part of our DNA of understanding when Jesus said, You are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth, and uh and that we need to engage in the culture, and we've stopped engaging in the culture. So Christians are not in power. And that's the problem is there's this false sense of, of what Christianity, uh, Christianity's involvement. And, uh, and so uh, th that is why you have this, these, the things that you see that anyone with a brain knows is way beyond the pale. You know, I mean, no one in their right mind thinks that a three-year-old um, can make up their decision on gender. I, I mean, that's just insanity at the core, right? That's beyond insanity that a three-year-old can decide. I'm I'm a girl. I was born a girl, but I'm really a boy. And I mean, that's just, that's just beyond the pale. But the politicians that are in power are promoting that. So Christians aren't in power. Let's just make that really clear. And a few of them that say they're Christians, um, they've made it really clear by their work and their fruit, that nothing could be further from the truth. And, you know, uh, and, you know, we, we have, you know, and, and we, the church has, the church has left the room and it's got to come back. But again, this is not a new thing. This is what happens in every generation. And it's our turn to, to step into this. And uh, we lost the sanctity of origin. As soon as we lost the battle that God created, the heavens and the earth, even though that the data is clearly there, there's no conclusive data on evolution, none, um, uh, with, with the origin of man. But that's 97% of that is taught in schools. So how did this happen? The church let it happen. Uh, and then so the sanctity of origin, the sanctity of life, that since God didn't create it, then life, you know, the babies in the womb doesn't mean anything. And well, it's because of Rape and incest, that's only less than 1% of the cases. So 99% it's convenience. A woman, you know, of their own free will, not because of rape and incest, has sex, gets pregnant, and says, I take no responsibility for my choices, this baby I want to kill. That's, you know, we've and, and the church has just kind of let it happen. Sanctity of marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman, that there's something very sacred about that. Um, now the sanctity of gender, that God did not create them. Uh, God, we weren't created in God's image and likeness. He didn't create a male and female. And because of that, the people in power are not Christians. And they're not Christians because the church is not voting. Uh, and it's not voting because it doesn't understand its historic and its biblical responsibility to invade the culture and keep it Uh, and 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 God, time and time again, all through the book of Judges, all through the book of Judges, you'd have these good kings, then you'd have these bad kings that legislated immorality. And we're simply in that cycle because man takes the wheel and away from Jesus. Wow. So when we invade culture, uh, that that's super interesting right there, because let's just stay in the topic of education and maybe even what you were saying, you know, the, the little kids who are being taught, uh, choose your gender. Right. right. So let's just think education, kids going to school. This right. is what I'm witnessing, okay? Right. I'm witnessing a, a tremendous amount of parents who are pulling their kids out of public schools. And these exactly. are Christian parents. So, I'm, I mean, I'm all about you got to teach your own kids. But also when you're saying we're not influencing culture, how can we even influence if we're – it's almost like let's just say kids have the Holy Spirit. And we take them out of public education. 
There's no more Holy Spirit. There's no more common sense. There's no there's no more truth amongst culture, right? And, and I think I, I just want to debate this a little bit because I think you're a yeah, proponent. Yeah, I, I will tell you. Right? right? You're a little Listen, bit of a proponent to. Uh, kids are not kids. Kids are sponges. They're not the light of the world. The the parents have that responsibility, and the the lie is that, oh, we got to keep our kids in and let them get indoctrinated with all this filth because they're the light. No, God made it really clear. Permit not the kids to come to me. That's like, you know, and that's and that's such a road lie that somehow your five or six-year-old is to stay in school and get indoctrinated with this doctrine of literally of demons because they're the light. No, no, they're, they're the sponges. <laughs> and, you know, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when that, they, during the age of innocence, the Bible is clear, these kids are protected under him. And they get to the age of reason where they accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. I can see that argument in high school. I can't see that argument with a five, six, seven, eight-year-old. Hello? I mean, you know, and and all, they're sponges at that age. That's why God continues to tell us, guard your children. Protect your children, parents, train them up in the way they will go and they'll not depart from it. That is such a lie from the pit of hell. Like, let's keep my six year old in school and let them indoctrinate them and they'll be just fine. Really? The, you, the, 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 the parents, the, the schools have them for eight hours a day. You've got them for an hour at night, maybe. And you're going to compete with that? You can't because kids are sponges. And this is about a radical agenda. Uh, and, you know, in public school, let's talk about that, shall we? Uh, over $120 billion. It's the most expensive budget. It's half the budget of the state goes towards public school. There's been a 7,000% increase in administration. We have only 50% of our kids are uh, literate in math. Only 40% are literate in English. And we're last in overall literacy. Um, it, they, 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 the Hispanic community is worse. Seventy percent of Latino kids don't graduate high school, but they're the light. Let them stay in and fail miserably. I mean, eighty um, percent uh, of black kids don't graduate high school, and now um, they're with this radical agenda. The state has become the state religion, and the schools are the state church, and they're teaching them to hate different people of races that they're victims, they're sexualizing them down into grade school now. The California Healthy Youth Act is aggressively going after these kids. And the lie of the of the devil is somehow your six-year-old or your eight-year-old needs to stay in that school. They're sponges and they need to be taken out. And so um, the parents are doing the right thing. And by the way, it's not just Christian parents. You need to understand this. When I campaigned up and down the state, don't blame this on Christianity. Do you know as many Muslim families and Hindu families and Jewish families are taking their kids out because common sense and decency tells you that now we're at a place in the public school system in California where it needs to be defunded because it is so radical. Parents' values matter and the parents' values are not being honored at all. There is an agenda called the California Healthy Youth Act. It was implemented. It was it, it was started in 19 and 20. God gave us a glimpse with the shutdown so that parents could see what's really happening in public school. And and then um, and then uh, uh, it, that awakening began and it started to get rolled out in tw last year and this year. And it's a 10 year policy that said we're changing the English language less than a fraction of a percentage get to choose the definition of a pronoun. What about adjectives? What about verbs? I mean, really? You get to choose that and we're going to change all the textbooks um, because of a, a small percentage that desperately need help. Bless them. They need help. They need Jesus. They need to know who they really are. 80% of every single kid that says they're a different uh, gender uh, change, change back. And, uh, and, and so you have uh, you have this, you have a situation now 
where uh, they're exiting at a rapid rate because their 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 rights as parents are being destroyed. Laws are being passed, but before our eyes, because the, the you know because we bought into well maybe socialism is cool, Christianity isn't that big a deal. You know, hey, you know, let's just let it all hang out. Let's just let things happen the way they do. And uh, now, uh, you know, uh, your insurance pays for a child that wants to get a sex change down to 12 years old. In fact, in the state of California, uh, if you can find a doctor, um, they'll do it at any age. They'll start pumping your kid with uh, with with puberty blockers, chemical castration, the, the, the destruction of the womb of these kids and the parents now have don't have a say. Those are the rules. Those are the laws. They can get abortion at 14 without the parents having a say. Um, you know, uh, and so this is not just Christians. This is common sense in Christianity. And no Christian uh, that when this comes when it comes to your children, they're sacred ground. They haven't learned how to be light yet. You're the light. And parents, if you're the light, be the light and be the salt and get your kids out of public school, because if you don't, you will regret it. I can't tell you, Beto, the number of parents that have come to me in tears because they left their kids in under that lie. Well, they're light. They'll just be the light when they're really sponges. And I think they just keep them in in, uh, in school and then they get into college and within a year, they they call their moms, girls, and said, "I've cut my breast off. Um, I'm I'm pumping my body with testosterone, and I, I demand you call me your son." So there you go. It's like that's the lie of, "Hey, let the kids stay in and be the light." No, you're the light. They're the sponges, and it's your responsibility to guard them in the light. And uh, and so that's why they need to leave. Because unfortunately, we need to rescue our punished public schools. And the only way to do it is to kill it, is to defund it to a point where they finally wake up and they get back to the basics of why we had these institutions. Reading, writing, arithmetic. Stay out of the religious game, please. Stay out of it. They haven't. They've replaced every other form of religion with their own ideology and religious beliefs that Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Christians reject. There are certain things they just they're not part of their core values. And last time I checked in our nation, there's religious freedom and every single one of those faiths. Yeah, you can find a couple of outliers, but the core of them say, no, that's a line too far. Far. I'm getting my kids out. Wow. Ooh, man, that's that's so much. But let's do a final call. I think uh, what I'm getting out of all of this, I'm here in California. I feel like. Man, I, I need to be like a hundred percent focused on my kids. Yes, and, and I mean, I, I could lead into other conversations about immigration, which I I think maybe for another episode. But, yeah, I'm passionate about that. I love awesome. these people that are here. So on on <laughs> another, I mean, let's just close it right here. Let's do a call for. I think what I'm getting for, from this is. You are saying there's a lot of people, maybe even the majority of people in this state yes. who have common sense, but they have not been involved. And you're talking about people from different, even like religious or cultures, yes, or whatever you yes. want to call it, Jewish, Muslims, Hindus, right. Christians. And you're saying these people believe in common sense. These people believe things are getting too stretched by right. a minority group. So what right. would be your... Your awakening call to to these common censors. If these are the majority, what would be your call? I would to tell them? every single one of them li listening to your broadcast, it's time to go back to common sense. This government has forgotten who we are as Californians, and they've for forgotten who we are uh, as uh, as Americans, and they disrespect our values. Parents' values matter. And every single California has to wake up and stop just pulling the lever D or R and start to research the candidates. It's time to do radical surgery on our politicians because they don't care about you. They care about their, their it's a fact. And they definitely don't care about your chair, your children. And so we need to get involved politically. The church was birthed because of politics. It's a time for 
boldness, for us to walk together in unity and pray for boldness and stand boldly um, and have take our voices back so that uh, so that we take our, our, our state back. We still can do that in this country. And if we don't, it'll be our fault. Mm. So, so let's would, do it. Would There's you be, still hope. Would you be OK with, let's say. I think the, the the common denominator here is common sense. So would yes. you be okay with like a common censor Muslim, a common censor Hindu yes, absolutely. to run? So yes, the conversation absolutely. is bigger I than mean, Christianity. Listen, <laughs> anyone that listen, anyone that runs against this ideology, that's the key. Is that uh, that the the the, the look at anyone? That has common sense, and common sense means that they stop this radical agenda, right? It's this radical agenda that needs to be stopped, and uh, and it is radical. It is insanity, and uh, and it, they, you know, uh, running in the middle. It's really running in the middle. You know, the biggest, you know, the biggest party is independence in the state. Mm. That's that's the party. And my, I'm, I'm a voice in the wilderness for common sense. And I believe we can come together in, in our, in what we have in common and, 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 and not the differences. That's what made this country great. That's the Christian, that's, that's the Christian um, journey. That's the Christian miracle is that it gave space for this. But then it got taken advantage of and a radical fringe, just like all through history, They're power mongols. They don't care about you and I. History tells us time and time again, that's the case. You cannot trust them. And now they're taking your children from you. So this is the great wake up call. And this is our faith. And this is what it means to be followers of Jesus. All right, Sam. <laughs> so this is your chance to go from blasphemous to divine. And that means we're going to start with our blasphemous emoji from your vantage point. What is the worst idea out there, the, the furthest away from God, the one that is blasphemy? The one that's blasphemy is that um, children, uh, it's, it's the sexualization of our children. It's, the, it's, it's that transgender sexualization. It's the trafficking of our children in education. What are you skeptical of or where do you see skepticism played out in this conversation? I think the skepticism is that it's that there is no hope. It's too late. Mm. Well, the next one is inspired. So what inspires you or where do you see hope? I see hope in Jesus. It inspires me that there's always hope in Jesus. Jesus's model inspires me. Holy. What is a holy idea in this conversation? The holy idea is that God and his son and the Holy Spirit alone are holy. They're holy and they're to be worshiped because of love. Love, Their love is holy. And lastly, divine. What is the highest idea you can think of in this conversation? Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life is divine. All right. I like that, man. That was super concise. So let's finish it off with where can people find you? You know, if they if they want to maybe support your, your next run or they want to find out about your uh, homeless homeless ministry, your home, your ministry with the undocumented in Oxnard, where can right. people go? Yeah. You uh, come to our website, embracejesus.org. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, or, or follow me on Instagram, samgalucci.ca, Sam, G-A-L-L-U-C-C-A, U-C-C-I, at C-A, and on Facebook. And uh, come check us out. All right, my friends, there you have it. Saving America by saving California with Sam Gallucci. Sam, thank you so much for being on the show. I'll see you on the next one. And I just want to say, my friends, um, you know the whole shebang. 
subscribe, like, share this episode with a friend if it was helpful, if it was inspiring, if you feel like somebody needs to hear this, give us a positive review wherever you're listening or watching, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Roku TV, everywhere you're watching. Thank you, and I'll see you guys on the next one. <laughs>